Okay, I think we can start. Uh, I am distributing you the homework number two. The first problem is actually not a very difficult problem, but basically it simply asks you to compare two deterministic systems. There is no stochasticity in the demand. So let us see how you are going to work on that. The second and the third problems, the second one actually has two problems. And the third one uh, uh, has, has one problem. Uh, the first one is related to the notion of the application of the notion of the echelon stock, which is a deterministic system. Those of you who took 460 at some point in time, last semester or last year or the previous year, may know it. But otherwise, I think it is a very straightforward chapter. It's an extension of EOQ where you have two levels and you determine the EOQ quantities accordingly, series system. And the third question is actually an algorithm, which is again using the same notion. And there is some reading associated with that, so you have to do that reading before you do the, the homework. Okay? I think it is understandable, because what we are covering here is sort of a more complicated version of it. So I think these are going to be good exercises in that respect. Okay, any, any other comments or questions? Now, uh, I decided that we should have the exam on the last day of March, which is, I think, 31st of March, Tuesday. It's not going to be in, in class hour, because I know that it's too early in the morning. Some of you, uh, well, we, we need more activity before we can solve problems. So I scheduled the exam to 5.30 in the evening. And uh, is there anybody who has courses there? You have a class? On Tuesday 31st, which exam is that? Italian. Uh, at what time? In between 4 and 6? 5 and 6. Okay, then you're going to come a little bit late. Okay? So I'll, I'll give you another half an hour, but then you'll come, and you're, you're going to get, of course, the full time. Okay. And uh, because there is no other place that I can do, I don't want to do it in the, in the lecture hours. And of course, that day we are not going to have any course in the morning, so that you can have some sleeping time, and then you will recover in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, Last time, if you recall, we were talking about Clark and Scarf models, and I'm planning to finish it today. I went a little bit slower than I expected, but I don't think that it is, it is a problem. We can make it up. The important part is that you understand what's going on. Okay? Any questions on what we did on Tuesday? Okay. Now, if you recall, on Tuesday, we had two equations that we wrote eventually, equation number 8 and equation number 9. Equation number 8 is the equation where we actually, in the second echelon, we can apply the optimal solution. So if you recall, how did we describe that? The cost is going to be C1 of xn bar minus u, which means that we were able to bring the system up to the ideal point that we really expect, where xn1, xn bar, is the optimal order up to level for installation, uh, for the lowest level installation, closest to the, uh, uh, to the demand, which we call installation number one. Okay, we, we number from in terms of closeness to the demand point. And there, uh, actually, we, we, if optimal is applied, this is going to be the solution for the specific lead time that we mentioned last time. So this is going to be two integrals from 0 to infinity. And then we have uh, L of x n bar minus uh, T1. minus t1 minus t2, phi of t1, phi of t2, dt1, dt2. Okay, so this is actually uh, what we have here. And then we have, of course, another term, 
plus alpha, which the term which actually combines the future effects. So this is going to be Fn minus 1, Xn bar minus T phi of T dt. Okay, so this is the cost if we can achieve Xn cap. Now, on the other hand, in equation 9, we said that, well, we know that Xn cap may not be reached because there may not be enough stuck in the, in, in the second installation. So if there is no enough stuck in the second X installation, then we simply say that let X2 be the available amount. And of course, in this case, X2 is going to be less than Xn bar. Note that X2 is the amount, the, is the system, the echelon, the, it's the system stock. In other words, it is basically the stock which is in installation one plus installation two in terms of echelon inventory. But still, again, Xn bar is also in terms of echelon inventory. So if X2 bar is not capable of satisfying this quantity, then we can only bring the system up to X2 bar. Okay? So instead of bringing it to Xn bar, which is the ideal point, we are going to stay a little bit below that, if it is not available. So in that case, the cost that we are going to incur will be exactly the same thing, but now instead of Xn bar, we're going to have X2. So let me call this function, it's an auxiliary function, it is not defined in the text, but let's call it X. Uh, and bar function. Okay? So this is then going to be x, h of x2 function. So the difference which is written in equation 10 is simply h x2 minus h x n bar is going to be the additional cost of not satisfying the order quantity. In other words, as we have another installation where we assume that it is ordering in a certain pattern, this difference is going to be additional cost of not satisfying the order of uh, installation one. Now, in a single location problem, if you recall, we know that if the Installation 2, instead of installation 2, if we have a supplier which can supply infinite quantity, okay, then we are sure that this function is always going to be equal to zero. Why? Because we know that actually the, uh, it can be satisfied always because there is no shortage. So hence, we don't have this additional cost coming into picture. But now, in the case where we have another installation there, which is ordering from the supplier, then we, this is going to be the additional cost. So it turns out that this cost is the key cost which is affecting the interaction between installation one and installation two. If we didn't have this cost, it will be the cost of installation one coming into picture, which is similar as a single installation problem. Okay? Whereas now we have this cost coming in. And as you can see, this cost is not only a function of Xn bar, which is independent of what's going on in the second uh, installation. Okay? Note that Xn bar is independent of what's going on in the second installation, because whether there is shortage or not is not important when you are determining Xn bar. Okay? You are determining Xn bar ideally. But unfortunately, in terms of realizations, you cannot achieve that level. So this additional cost is going to be a function of X2, which is the system stock that's available, uh, well, in the, the system stock which is available, and it will be a function of Xn bar, but as you can see, we can actually uh, separate these two functions from each other. In other words, they are additive functions, and there is no, nothing that combines x2 and xn bar uh, in, in multiplicative terms. 
So you have an additive function of x2, an additive function of xm bar. Okay, but you have the cumulative of it, of course. Okay, and so this is the additional cost of not satisfying the demand. So now you can see that we obtain the measure in which if we cannot satisfy the demand of a certain installation, we have sort of a implied penalty that comes into picture. Okay, there is an implied penalty. This is the implied penalty, actually. Now, if you recall, when we were talking about installation two, this is installation two, installation one, and here we have the demand. I said that the L function for installation two might be different. What is the L function? L function is the holding and backorder cost function for a single period. Now, here, there is no meaning of having a backorder function. Why? Because you are not actually, you are not satisfying something which is related to a customer. You are only not satisfying an order which comes within the factory. So there is no explicit cost that you are going to charge. There is no reason for that. Well, there, there will be cases where there will be reasons, but this is not one of them. Because we're talking about a single entity which, is, which governs all the decisions. Now, the key here is that even if we don't have a backorder cost, this cost actually can be seen as the cost of backorder in installation two. Because that's the penalty that you are paying if it's not available, this is the penalty that you are paying. Okay, now this is a key observation because once we have this key observation, we are going to have another result. Now, we also observe that, observe, that equation 10, which is the difference of this one, this, this, this hx2 minus hxn bar, is convex in x2. In other words, the, the part which is going to be the decision that you give here, and the part that comes from installation 1, is actually a convex function. Now, we are going to see that the remaining part is also a convex function. The L function is a convex function. So ultimately, the decision that you are going to give in installation 2, which is x2, okay, what is the order up to level for the system, okay, is going to be a convex function because of this result. In other words, the additional term is not a complicating term. It's sort of a term which is also a convex term. Okay, this is going to be instrumental, actually, in obtaining the result. Now, at this point, it is, we are ready to consider the whole problem. Okay? Now we can consider the whole problem. So, note that what we did here is we simplified the problem by saying that we have only two installations. We specified the lead time so that we can write the functions easily. But even if we have more complicated functions, it's not going to be a problem to write those. But it will be more complicated and longer to write. Now, the, the key here is now the following. Now we now consider the whole problem. What do we mean by the whole problem? In a given time frame, we are going to decide all our decision variables. So we are now considering Cn, which is going to be x1. This is the amount which is available in installation 2. W1 is the quantity which you have ordered before and it's on the way. And then we have x2, which is the system stock. Now remember the echelon idea. This is actually what we have here. So this is the system stock. So again, this is stock net inventory in installation one, on transit and system stock. Of course, because of the lead times that we specified, this is simpler. Actually, it could have been more uh, uh, difficult. Okay. Now, this is, by definition, the minimum expected total discounted cost for the end period problem. So now, 
I am not only considering installation one, but both of the installations at the same time. So this is what we want to solve, actually, at every step. But we have an idea on how to solve the individual uh, problem that we have here. Moreover, we now have seen that the effect to the system cost uh, because of the inability to satisfy the order of installation one uh, can be written in a very nice way. Okay, so those are the two things that we know. Now, what are the decisions that we are going to require here every period? We have two decisions every period, actually. One of them is the decision uh, we are going to order quantity, quantity to order, this is decision one, to order for the system, and let's call it Z. In other words, I am going to order Z to installation two. So here we have the supplier. So Z is going to increase the contents of the system. So Z is going to be ordered from outside. And then what? And also, how much to place, or how many units to place, how many to place in transit. And I'm going to call it Y. Now, actually, there are two decisions if you look at system-wide. In other words, the quantity that I am going to order from outside, okay, this is sort of the newcomers, and then I will have some amount here, and I'm going to place this amount to transit so that it will arrive to installation one two periods later in this specific case. So these are the two decisions. Now, we have an idea on what Y should be because we already have dealt with that problem individually. Don't forget that. But these are the two decisions. Okay, so uh, do you have any questions? Okay. So uh, what happens is that we have these two decisions. So for installation one, okay, I know that from the previous properties, as x1 plus w1 is the quantity which is going to be, this is the inventory position. And I know that uh, actually the y quantity that I need to have it in transit should be greater than x1 plus w1 and less than x2. What does this mean? The quantity that you are going to, uh, well, now the way that I, I see the variables, by the way, are all cumulative, okay? In other words, how many units to place uh, means, in this case, actually, uh, what should be the inventory position that I'm going to bring installation one? So Y, in this case, is the inventory position for installation one that you desire. So it means that my current inventory position is x1 plus w1. You are going to increase that inventory position. And that inventory position cannot be more than what is available in the system. OK? This is basically the way, the way to think about it. Now, of course, this problem, OK, we already solved this problem. So let me call the cost, the expected cost of this problem as C1. So what we have is we have the expected cost of ordering this quantity. This is the ordering cost. Now, I am going to order this quantity, which means that what, do, what is the meaning of ordering cost? Well, we were having some payments. I don't know why, but there might be some payments related to transportation, so on and so forth. But this is the uh, ordering cost. And what will be the stock on hand or net, net stock uh, next period, 
net stuck next period is going to be, well, I already have x1, which is my current next stuck. W1 will be arriving in the beginning of next period. And then I'm going to have T demand for that period. So my net stock is going to be this one. How about stock in transit? This is the next period. Okay? The, the next period, the stock in transit will be simply what? Okay, now next period again, I'm talking about next period because I'm trying to sort of uh, write the state variable for the next period. So if x1 plus x1 w1, remember this is the way that we describe the system. x1 is the net inventory. w1 is the inventory that will arrive next period. So in the beginning of next period, the next stock is going to be x1, the new arrivals w1, minus the demand. How about stock in transit in the beginning of next period? What will be the stock in transit? Now, the previous one in transit, which is W1, has arrived. So we only have the quantity that we ordered in transit. So it is going to be Y minus X1 minus W1, which is the quantity that we ordered this period. Okay? So it is going to be the only remaining quantity in transit. Okay? Again, so if I, if I draw, remember we had two periods. Here, I order Y minus X1 minus W1 units. So I look at the system here. So W1 is ordered previously. W1 will arrive here. So this one is going to arrive here. So when I look at the in-transit quantity, the only in-transit quantity is Y minus X1 minus W1. Okay, so this is actually what I said here. Now, let us do the same thing for the system. So what is happening for the system? So uh, for the system, we are going to have the same, a similar idea. Now, uh, x2 plus z, remember, x2 is my current level. I ordered Z units, and of course, T is going to be deducted from the system. Why? Because we, those are the demand that we are going to satisfy, or we satisfied. So in the beginning of the next period, the quantity that I ordered now is going to arrive. So this is going to be the quantity uh, available. So this is the new system stock. Next period. So you can see that the ordering quantity is going to be C to Z. Remember, the ordering function was different for installation 2. There was a fixed cost. So it will be a function of Z. So as a result, my state was X1, W1, and X2. After taking all these decisions, in the beginning of the next period, my state will go, okay, so now I'm in the position of like redefining my state. X1 will become X1 plus W1 minus T. W1 will become Y minus X1 minus W, the, the previous W1, okay. And then x2 will become x2 plus z minus t. So what I did is I wrote the transformation from one period to the other after taking all these decisions. So this is actually one of the key steps. In other words, you simply follow your steps. This, this corresponds to saying that you write the state equations. In dynamic programming, you have the state equations that you write. Actually, this is what, what you are writing. State is going to change with your decisions, and you write the state for the next period. So now, uh, let us write the L functions. Now, I am going to have L twiddle uh, of uh, x2. Now, this L function doesn't contain regular backorder cost. Okay, so it only contains probably holding cost. 
That's the reason why I differentiated this L from the regular L that I defined. So it is going to be a different type of a function. And in this case, this is going to be the holding shortage total. Uh, I should say one period holding and shortage cost. But this is sum of two installations. And with respect to the ordering function, we are going to have C2 of Z plus C1 of Y minus X1 minus W1. This is the ordering cost. So I am simply finding the consequences of my decisions. And then I am going to have what else? Well, I am going to have the C value, which is going to come from the next period on. And once I know this transformation, I can write that C function. So that, that will be the next thing that I'm going to write. So my function, my problem becomes as follows. So now uh, my problem becomes as follows. I have Cn x1, w1, x2, which is equal to, okay, minimum of over all y's, okay, uh, which is less than x2 and greater than x1 plus w1, and over all z, which is non-negative, you, you can only order positive quantities. And then we have the following functions. We have, let's start with the ordering function. We have C2 of Z, the ordering cost in installation 2, plus C1 of Y minus X minus W, the ordering cost in installation 1, plus I am going to have L twiddle of X2, which is the one period holding and shortage cost for installation 2. And then I will have L of X1, which is the regular shortage and holding cost for installation number 1. And then I'm going to have alpha, so I'm going to carry everything to the next period. Intake, take the expected value over what? Over the optimal solutions that we are going to have from n minus 1 onwards. So we're going to have Cn minus 1. But now the state is going to be x1 plus w1 minus t. And then we're going to have y minus x1 minus w1 and x2 plus z minus t, phi of t dt. And we are going to close the parentheses. Okay? So this is basically the recursion that we always write. And then, of course, as a starting condition, I'm going to set C0 equal to 0. In other words, beyond the horizon, I don't care about the costs. Okay? I only, I'm only interested about the cost within the horizon. Excuse me? Oh, this should be x1. Yeah, thank you. Now, the key here is... now. Remember, we identified L of x1. We know what the functional form is. We identified the property, if you recall, that the decision is only going to be a function of the inventory position. So x1 plus w1 actually comes, always comes uh, together. x1 plus w1, x plus 1, x1 plus w1, which means that actually and here we have the same thing. And here we have the same thing as well. Well, no, here it's only a fun function of, yeah, here we have the same thing as well. Because this is the cost that we are going to incur. Uh, well, this is a constant, actually. It's not a function of the decision variables, because it's a function of the starting point. So given this, actually, we can do the same transformation that we did for the single installation problem. So actually, the state variables are x1 and an x2 in that respect. Okay? So 
uh, this is going to be one uh, uh, step for reduction. Another step of reduction, if you recall, we were able to write the optimal solution of the single installation problem in terms of X2 as well. Okay? So what you have here is you have an additive function which is going to differentiate X1s and X2s from each other. So actually, you can, it's, it's a matter of now algebra, simply working everything out. You can show that Cn, X1, W1, X2 can be written. Uh, we already showed it actually, but I didn't, I don't want to show the details, which is Cn of X1, W1, okay, plus another G function, which is, which is a subscript N of X2. In other words, these two are additive functions. Now, we know how to analyze this part. Now, if this is, this is actually the intuition, I, I think I have built up the intuition to show that these are going to be two different functions, separable functions. So, how do you optimize that? Well, the optimization is going to be, of course, simple if you have separable functions. You're going to do the optimization separately. Okay? Here, this function is going to be optimized over x1, as we did before, actually. Okay? And then we have this gn function, which is going to be optimized uh, independently. And it turns out that that also corresponds to a single installation type of a problem because everything is convex. So for here, the optimal solution says that the uh, policy for installation one is an order up to type policy. And this one, as we had C2, including the fixed cost, this is going to be an SS type decision. And uh, you make those decisions separately. But the key here is that the function that you use in minimization is no longer the regular L function, but it is a combination of the L function with the cost difference that we have defined in equation 10, the difference of those ages. Remember? In other words, if as we cannot satisfy installation one's demand, we were paying an additional cost, that is going to be included in GN of X2, plus the fixed ordering cost, plus the part of the shortage and holding cost that is left, okay? which is also a linear function, of course. Now, so this is actually the key result. What, what you do is, so if, if I write this explicitly, this GM function, it includes the penalty of not satisfying Installation one's order, okay, we cannot bring it up to date. So this is actually equation 10 in the text. And plus it includes uh, L star, L, L twiddle of X2, which is the holding and shortage cost, but we don't usually charge anything for shortage, so it's only the holding cost. And plus ordering cost for installation two. Okay? So these are the quantities which are included in this G function. And there is nothing related to the installation one's decisions other than this part, and we know how to write that part, actually. It is separable with respect to X1 and X2. When you are optimizing over X2, the actual location of x1 plus w1 is not going to affect your optimal decision. So you can find the optimal x2 independent of what the current x1 plus w1 is. Because that's a system order up to level that you really want to achieve. Okay. So this is actually the result of, uh, this is the main result of Clark and Scarf. Now, of course, this result is pretty old in the sense that uh, this was proved in 58, 59, published in 60. And of course, you can expect that a lot of extensions to this is now available. 
In other words, we have more general cases which is fitting to this structure. Now, the key observation here is the difference between equations 8 and 9. So there is an additional cost that you pay because you, your order is not satisfied completely. So this implies immediately the following shipment rule for installation 2. If an order comes from installation 1, and if you cannot fulfill the order, you only fill the part that you can, and the remaining is going to be back-ordered. Now, on the other hand, if you recall, in industry, if you made, made some observations, they do not do this. They think that they are going to save from the transportation cost, because there is an additional cost of sending the new items again. But the idea is that you should send the quantity which is available and drop your stock level to zero, and that's part of the optimal policy as well for installation too. Okay. Uh, okay, I am going to erase which, which one? This is system, this one I think. Okay. Now let me write the results that followed Clark and Scarf. <coughs> and certain extensions that are not possible as well. Okay. Now, first of all, remember we charge the holding cost to the beginning inventory, shortage cost to the ending inventory. Of course, that is not a problem. Uh, holding and shortage costs charged at the same time. This is an obvious extension. It, it is the simplest possible extension. And then, so you don't need to have a one in the beginning, the other in the end, because if you remember, the one in the beginning is not affecting your decisions anyhow. So you have that, that that's included in the future costs only. Okay, and then uh, we have more general cost structures is possible as long as L of Y is convex. In other words, you can have convex functions there. In other words, you don't need to charge linear holding costs or linear backorder costs. You can make it more general. Now, one can see is this as something which is not very important because how are you going to charge nonlinear costs? But at least knowing that is an important factor. You, we usually don't estimate nonlinear costs, but knowing this fact that your results are generalizable is, is an important factor in general. Okay, so this is, of course, we did this for two installations, but if we have n installations, the idea is the same. Now you can see that there will be a certain portion of the additional term which is going to be carried from one installation to the next until the last one. Okay? So if, for example, we had three installations, from one to two there will be an additional cost of not satisfying. From two to three there will be an additional cost of not satisfying, and which is going to be included in their own CNs. And then we would have the last one like this as well. So you can extend the same idea, and it is true. Actually, the proof in the, in the text, in the original text, is made on the two installation case, and then uh, assumed that it can be done for n installation and proved for n plus 1 installations, and so that uh, deduction, induction basically. And so uh, basically that, that's the way that the proof is done. Otherwise, the notation gets very dirty. But nowadays we have sort of nicer proofs for the same thing, actually, like easier and nicer. You use different possibilities. Now, another very nice extension is, now we had a series system here. Now we know that in general multi echelon systems are not in series. So for the assembly systems, now what do we mean by assembly systems? By assembly systems, we mean the following. You have two installations. Let's say you have three installations here, two installations, and like this. OK. 
Okay? If we have something like this, this is an assembly type. You see, uh, you, these are sub-assemblies, that's the idea. And like you, you, you bring all of those together. Okay? So if you have an environment where you have multiple manufacturing plants, okay, this is going to be the typical case. So given these assembly systems, it turns out that similar results are available. Okay, these are the work done by uh, a number of people in between 89 and 90. Uh, one of them is Sven Aksater, and which A had a Swedish sign at the top. I don't remember, but I think I don't remember. So it is by Aksater, and there is, there is this another Swedish guy who actually did the original, but Sven Aksater simply cleaned it up. And this is a very important proof because basically this is a very complicated system if you come to think of it. Okay? But you can extend the same result. All the properties that we have seen here holds for the assembly system. Okay? Which is, which is a very nice result. Okay. Now, another extension is customer demand can be anywhere. as long as it is independent and identically distributed. In other words, we assume that we only have customer demand in the last installation, in the, in the lowest level installation, whereas it can be anywhere in general, which is a very good issue because in general, if you have a manufacturing system like this, you are usually manufacturing spare parts as well. So there is an other demand for not only the demand for the manufacturing, for the assembly, but you have other demands as well. So this is another extension. Now, one thing that people tried a lot but couldn't succeed was the following extension. Okay, so this is going to bring us to the next paper. So uh, this is what I want to talk for the last five minutes. Okay, any questions on this? Now, nowadays we have some, uh, you see, uh, the computation of this algorithm is, is not very easy because what you have is you have a DP algorithm in general, and, but this time you have DP algorithm with multiple, uh, uh, with, with multiple states. The state definition is a vector. And then, of course, then the DP algorithm is going to work very slow. So there are a number of different heuristics which are offered for, for this problem in general. And there are, these heuristics are the so-called news vendor problem type heuristics. And you have it in your, uh, in your uh, not re recommended reading, not the required reading, but you have those type of papers in the uh, recommended reading. And these approximations were published in 2006, 2007. So we're not talking about an area which is not doing anything, but basically, even with the current capacity of computational, the, the, our ability of computational capacity, uh, we still may need some approximations to make computations of this. Okay? But it turns out that those are very accurate, and there is some theoretical reason why they are accurate, and, but it's probably beyond the scope of this course. Now, a number of things that I should talk about this specific paper and the supply chains. I think I have to make the connection. Now, what we assumed in this work is that we assumed that information is available to all the installations, demand information, cost information. Because remember the equation uh, 10, the, the, the H equation that I, I wrote, has all the cost values of the installation 1. In other words, we know, as in installation two, we know the costs which are affecting installation one, and we make our decision accordingly. So basically, this type of structure is only suitable for a centralized structure. Centralized meaning that you have a single owner, and the single owner controls everything. Now, what happens if the owner of the factory and the owner of the retailer is not the same person? In other words, who is going to get this information to the factory so that things are going to work much better? 
Now, supply chain actually deals with these type of problems. Of course, you need to know the best solution. The best solution is the solution when they are actually part of the same firm because in that way, they maximize the total profit. However, in reality, we won't be able to achieve that unless we take some precautions. Now, information is not going to be available. That's the key issue. Okay? So this is the, the main relation between this and the, the supply chains. But it's the same structure. Everything is the same. Mathematically looking at it, if you have all the information, it's the same. But unfortunately, we don't have the information, and we're going to see what we can do. Contracting is one of the remedies that we are going to apply to this. Okay. Now, let's come to the other difficulty. I talked about the assembly systems. How about the distribution systems? Distribution system is just the reverse. So you have one factory here, then you distribute it to warehouses, then from warehouses you distribute to several retailers. This is a typical distribution system. And question is, the findings of uh, Clark and Scarf, is it applicable to distribution systems? Now, let us see the problem with, with this. Okay. Now, what we have here, let's concentrate on this part. Very simple system. Okay. Now, this guy is going to give an order. This guy is also going to give an order. Now, if there is sufficient stock here, no problem. In other words, the orders are going to be satisfied. So if we were to assume that this, had, this has infinite stock, life would be very simple. Now, the problem is this, does, this guy doesn't have infinite supply because there is another supplier who is supplying this guy. So there is a certain inventory uh, uh, policy which is applied here. So now, uh, the problem occurs when the ordering quantity here plus the ordering quantity here exceeds what is available. So what are we going to do? How are we going to solve the problem? You can say that, well, we are going to allocate it in a certain way. It turns out that that allocation problem is not an easy problem. Because you might have different costs here, different demand distributions there, different lead times. And the solution of that allocation problem turns out to be a very difficult problem in itself which actually kills the nice property of the additivity. In other words, the allocation problem is not only a function of x2 anymore. Here, there is no allocation problem. So, so we could have written everything like this. Whereas now, the allocation problem is not going to allow us to write everything in this additive form. Why? Because we know that the solution of that allocation problem is a function of the stock that we have here and stock that we have here compared to the what is available. So all of them is going to be important when you have this allocation. Think about the very simple uh, deterministic knapsack kind of a problem. Okay? If, you, if half of the knapsack is full in one case and in other words, if the capacities are different, you need to know the capacities before you can make the best decision. So this is like this. If the inventory levels are different here, it is going to affect the outcome. So if it affects the outcome, then the function is no longer separable. So given a combination of inventory, you're going to have a solution. And for each combination, the solution is going to be different. So no longer x2 can be optimized independent of what's going on in the inventory levels of x1. So the separability is that which makes the problem extremely complicated. And there are certain conditions under which this may be eliminated. We are going to see that, uh, uh, well, we are going to see a part of it on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday morning. But with the paper that we're going to start after that, the paper by Bola pra Pragada, which is, I think, an extension of Eppen Schrage, the week after that. Do you have the weekly program? Okay, let me, let me check immediately. 
So if you look at uh, week four, uh, we already covered Epen. The next, two, the next paper by Bola pra Pragada, Bo Bola Pragada and et al. is going to be the paper that we are going to study. And I will basically use the notation of Epen Schrage here in the recommended reading because that's a simpler notation. But it's the same paper. I will go over the same paper. So you're going to see how we can deal with that allocation problem because it is a huge interest in supply chains on how to do that allocation. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, you can ask me your questions in my office or you can ask it through emails if you have something in mind. And I think this is one of the key papers to understand the relations in multi-echelon inventory structures. Okay, I'll see you on Tuesday. Have a nice weekend.